So it was December 11th, 1953, when a small group of people met for the very first time at a little storefront on Fillmore Street, not far from here. We actually have a picture of that storefront, I think, guys. Do we have a picture of that storefront? That was the first time that First Baptist Church, now Hollywood Community Church, met on Fillmore Street, not far from here. The church was officially organized the last Sunday of January in 1954, 66 years ago today. So today, we celebrate 66 years of ministry at Hollywood Community Church. God blessed the church from the very beginning. And shortly after, they started meeting at that that storefront on Fillmore Street, but shortly afterward, they bought a piece of property on the corner of 441 and Taft and began building buildings. We have some pictures that show some of the original buildings of Hollywood Community Church. You can see there is the, the can you go back to the other one? Can you go back to the other one? I don't know who's there. So, so, so there is like the chapel now and the big auditorium hadn't even been built yet. And it looks like there was a trailer park on the south side along Taft Street. We can go to the next one. That's the east parking lot over here. Wasn't even paved yet. That's the east parking lot. They didn't have the, uh, the canopy over the front. But you can see, look at the cars. Does anybody have a car like that anymore? I don't think, I don't think anybody has a car like that anymore. The, it wasn't even paved. We have another picture. We have another picture. That shows going west where our ball fields are and where the parking lot is and all of that. I think we have another picture. Do we have another picture? That's the children's ministry. Look at all the, the children's workers there in the children's ministry there. And I want you to see the auditorium back in the 70s. Look how it looks to be absolutely full, filled there. So what a great legacy we have at HCC. Our first pastor was a man by the name of Dr. E.R. Bowers, who obviously has already gone home to be with the Lord. Dr. Bowers was then followed by Verl Ackerman. Let me just ask, how many of you were saved under Verl Ackerman? Would you lift your hand? You were saved under Verl Ackerman. By the way, we do have, and I, and I forgot I was going to do it then, we do have one of our charter members who was there on that day in 1953. I'm looking out and I don't see her. So, so, so Darlene Reeves, where is Darlene Reeves? Is she here? Right here. Would you be kind enough? Would you have her stand? This is one of our charter members. She was in that first service in 1953. She was there. God bless you. And so following Dr. Verl Ackerman was Pastor Buddy McCord. How many were saved under Pastor Buddy McCord's ministry? If you're here today and you were saved under his ministry, I have the privilege of being the sixth pastor of Hollywood Community Church. Through our 66 years, there have been a lot of great ministries that have been done in this place. You saw in the one picture all of the buses, right? So, so, so we had a bus ministry for years. We sent out, somebody can tell me how many buses, like scores of buses went out and brought in literally hundreds, if not thousands of boys and girls. If I'm not mistaken, Brian, you came in on the bus, right? So Brian Deutsch was saved through the bus ministry of Hollywood Community Church. Before, we, were you uh, also, Paul was as well. Before First Baptist, Church of, uh, First Baptist Church of Hollywood had their big Christmas pageant, we had a big Christmas pageant here. They had this huge Christmas pageant, and hundreds and thousands of people would come to the Christmas pageant. Baptist Towers was built for the purpose of housing missionaries. When they came back from the field, either, either part-time as they were here on furlough or even full-time after they retired. If I'm not mistaken, somebody correct me, but Lucanus Development Center that was right down the road was started as a ministry of Hollywood Community Church. Huge. Hollywood Christian School was here for more than 40 years. I say all of that, church, because of the legacy of our ministry 66 years of ministry is unbelievable. As I travel around South Florida and I travel around the country, I'm amazed on a regular basis people come up to me that I have no idea who they are and say, Brian, I want you to know that I was, I was saved. I became a believer at 
First Baptist Church of West Hollywood, or I became a believer at Hollywood Christian School. And not only here in South Florida, but as I travel the country, I, I meet people who began their faith here in this auditorium where you and I meet each and every week. I say that because the legacy of Hollywood Community Church literally extends around the world. So this morning at this moment, there are men that are preaching the gospel at different places all around the world that trusted Christ in this place. Men and women who are faithfully serving the Lord in all kinds of different ministries that came to Christ in this place. We have a tremendous legacy. I want to illustrate that this morning. So I've been carrying around this really big chain, and so I don't want you to think that I was chained up. So I'm going to ask several of our folks if they would come. I'm going to ask Bobby Orr if Bobby would come, and then uh, Devin and Molly. Where's Devin and Molly? Would Devin and Molly Lewis come down front? Could you both come? And Matt and Betty Sinelli, could you guys come? And then uh, I was asking Marvin, are you in here? Is Marvin in here? Could I ask Marvin to come down? And Pedro, would you come too on the other side of this? So, so let's kind of take this Let's kind of take this and stretch this, and then we're going to wrap it around, and I'm just teasing, so let's just kind of stretch this out, stretch this out, and, and come along here, and Marvin, come down here. So here's what I want you to see today. I want you to see, this chain represents Hollywood Community Church. I actually asked Mark Metcalf, he'd go buy me a brand new chain, and, and he didn't give me a brand new chain. He actually pulled one and said, Brian, I didn't buy one. I got this old one around, and I got to thinking this one is a better representation than a new one because this one's just a little beat up. It's been used through the years, but it's a great representation of what Hollywood Community Church is. And let's just imagine that this chain goes all the way back to December 11th, 1953. And everybody who has been a part of our ministry are on this chain. By the way, Bobby's been here quite a few years. Bobby, how many years have you been here? 52, 52 years. <laughs> Bobby's been here 52 years. Bobby's done everything at HCC except pastor, and she looks at me all the time. She said, you better behave or I'm going to take your job. <laughs> and so she also, she also reminds me that she's been through every, she's outlasted every other pastor, and she's going to outlast me. <laughs> she tells me that on a regular basis, all right? This chain represents our church. And then we have Devin and Molly. You guys have been here how long, Devin? 25 years. 25 years. Matt, you guys have been here how many years? 10, 10, 12 years, 10, 12 years. Actually, Matt's a little bit longer than that because Matt kind of grew up here, didn't you? Yeah, 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 since six. And Pedro, how long you been here? Five years. Five years. Marvin, how long you been here? Six years. six years. All right. So here's what I want you to see. This chain represents, and imagine this chain going all the way back to 1953. But imagine this chain extending forward. And here's what I want us to see today. This chain doesn't end, even though it ends right here. This chain doesn't end here. It doesn't end with Marvin. It doesn't end with Marvin's generation. What we want this chain to do is we want this chain to go continually forward until Jesus comes back. Amen. So let's give them a hand. You've done a great job. That's all you had to do today. That's all they had to do. Everybody wanted to ask me, so what are we going to have to do? I said, you're going to have to hold a chain. That's all you're going to have to do. You're going to have to hold a chain. Hey, here's what I want you to catch. And today, today our message is going to be just a little different because it's not going to be necessarily as, as exegetical as it normally is. But I want you to see a couple of things. As you can see this morning, we are a church of multiple generations. We're a church of diversity of many different ethnic backgrounds. The, the impact of HCC not only reaches backward until 1953, but the impact of HCC reaches forward as well. And catch this, believe this, pray for this, God is not done with Hollywood Community Church. He's not done. You and I are a part of the HCC family. 
You might sit back and say, Brian, I haven't been here 52 years like Bobby, or I haven't been here 25 years like Devin and Molly. Maybe I've only been here a short period of time, and Brian, maybe I just haven't been as involved as I would like to be. I come for the Sunday morning service, and that's what I do, but I want you to know, however long you've been here, whatever you do, whatever your part is, you are a part of Hollywood Community Church. And if you have your outlines in front of you, I want you to catch this point. It's this. You are a link in the chain of the history of Hollywood Community Church. So, so I, I thought about how do I title this message. I, I thought about titling it, You Are the Missing Link. But I thought you might misinterpret that or something. <laughs> All right. Or, or you are the connecting link. But it's true because that chain, that chain is made up of all different links. But every single one of those links in the chain is equally important. We're in the midst of a series that we've simply called, I Love the Church, from the beginning of the year. And, and we've talked about the fact that the church is not a building. This building, as wonderful as it is, is not Hollywood Community Church. It's not a building. The church is not a denomination. The church is not a program. It's not any of those things. The church is the people of God who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. You are the church. Say that with me again today. I am the church. I am the church. We are the church. We are the church. One day this beautiful building might not be here, but Hollywood Community Church will still exist because we are the body of Christ. We are the representative of Jesus Christ in our community. We saw in the second message that the church is the body of Christ and all of us are different members and all of us have different functions, but we all are a part of his body and Brad did a great job last week talking about the fact that the church is community. And community means that you are in it. You are a part of that community. Today, we simply look at the, at the topic, don't break the chain. Don't break the chain. And as I mentioned, you are a link in the chain of the history of Hollywood Community Church. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to read just a few verses I want to put them in context for us today, and I want, to, I want to encourage you today, I want to challenge you today, I want to cast vision today, I want to be thankful not only from where we've come, but I want to, I want to cast vision about where we're going in the future, and I want you to join me. So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and Paul is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace of that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see the chain there? We're going to come back and look at that in just a, in just a moment. Verse 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civil and pursuit, pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Paul tells Timothy and us, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. I mentioned Paul is writing to Timothy, his son in the faith. He, he writes him for the purpose of encouraging him to take the faith that he has received and not selfishly hoard it, not selfishly guard it, but to take that and pass that on to others. Did you notice four generations of believers in the verse? Paul who reached Timothy with the gospel, tells Timothy, says, Timothy, you take what you have heard and you pass it on to faithful men who will be able to what? Teach others also. Four generations. The apostle Paul reaching Timothy, Timothy sharing what he is not, what believed, his faith with others, who in turn will teach others also. One believer passing on his or her faith to another. One generation passing their faith on to another generation. 
So we sit back and ask ourselves today, so how is that done? So, so, so practically, how did, how did Timothy do it? How did Paul encourage Timothy to do it? And how do you and I, many generations removed in a completely different culture, how do we pass on our faith? Not only to the next generation, but let's be even a little bit more specific. To our sons and to our daughters, to our grandchildren to the people who are following in our footsteps. Paul mentioned several ways in the passage. Let me mention them quickly, and then I want to get practical today. So Paul says this, first of all, be a faithful witness. Be a faithful witness. He tells Timothy, he says, what you have been entrusted with. The word that's used in the ESV, if you have a King James Bible, it's, it's that which has been committed to you. The, the Message Bible says that which has been passed on to you. So so here's the idea. The idea is that somebody before you knew the gospel. And somebody before you loved you so much that they shared the truth of the gospel with you. They were entrusted with it and they passed it on. They were committed to it and they passed it on. They didn't hoard it. They didn't keep it. They didn't store it away. They didn't lock it in a savings, uh, save, uh, savings deposit box. They passed it on. They were what? Faithful witnesses. And Paul is challenging Timothy to be a faithful witness. We have a cabinet in our house that Vicki has all of these, um, I don't know what's in there, just kind of what's in there, like bowls and glasses and, you know, just stuff like that. So in this cabinet, in this cabinet are, are two vases, two beautiful old vases. I wanted to bring it today, but Vicki was afraid I would drop it. She didn't trust me. So especially with the chain in one hand, a valuable vase in the other, she just didn't trust me. But, 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 but in that cabinet are two vases. I don't know how much they're worth. I don't know how valuable they are money-wise. I know they're extremely valuable to Vicki because they were vases that belonged to her grandmother. Her grandmother had purchased, her grandmother had used. Her grandmother then passed that vase on to Vicki's mother. And my mother-in-law then took those vases and passed them on to Vicki. You see, so... In their family, they realized the value of those vases, and they wanted to make sure that the next generation benefited not only from the beauty of it, but benefited from the value of it. That's the analogy. That's the picture that Paul is painting in the passage. And here's what Paul is saying, church, that you and I have been given something much more valuable than those vases As a matter of fact, we've been given the most valuable thing, which is the gospel. We've been entrusted with it. And our responsibility is not just to hold on to it and make sure that it doesn't break, but our responsibility is to what? To pass it on to the next generation. For us to hold it, for us to guard it, for us to keep it is selfish. Paul tells Timothy, he says, Timothy, be a faithful witness we've been given something extremely valuable the gospel and we should not only treasure it and we should treasure it with all of our heart but we should pass it on there's a second metaphor that paul uses in the passage he says not only be a faithful witness but he says be a dedicated soldier in verses three and four uh, um, he actually uses three phrases to illustrate the dedication of the soldier he says first of all share in the sufferings of jesus christ it's a really interesting phrase that simply means suffer pain or hardship along with someone else is the ver is the verb that is being used he says secondly then don't get entangled in civilian pursuits Here's the idea. It's so easy for us to get distracted and get our minds off of that which is really important and get distracted by that which is unimportant. We were talking about this yesterday in our Saturday morning service, and I asked if, if there were any military men, and, and one man stood up. You could tell right away that he was a military guy. He was older, and I asked him, I said, so where did you serve? And he said, I served in the Army, and he said it proudly. He served in the Army, and I said, so let me ask you, what would your sergeant or what would your, you know, whatever the, uh, whatever the, uh, the ranks are in the military, what would your superior have thought if you'd have looked at him and said, Tomorrow I can't do that run we're going to do because I'm working at McDonald's tomorrow. 
So you guys go out and do your training stuff, but I'm going to be at McDonald's, and I'll join you the day after tomorrow. What would his superior have said? No way, Jose. Man, you're in the Army. (laughs) All right, when you're in the Army, you abandon all of those civilian pursuits, and you have one goal. You have the goal of being a soldier. That's what Paul says, and the idea is not that we have to leave everything behind and sell everything and become followers of Jesus Christ, but the idea is that of dedication. Are we dedicated to Jesus more than anyone or more than anything? That's what the passage is challenging us to do. And then he says this, because you please the one who enlisted you. And as I prayed through that this morning, I was so convicted about that. I'm I'm a people pleaser. If you guys know me, I'm a people pleaser. I, I want to please everybody. I want everybody to be happy with me. And if somebody's not happy with me, first of all, I'm miserable. And secondly, I'm making them miserable because I'm trying to do everything I possibly can to make them happy with me. I'm a people pleaser. But I'm reminded I really, really only have the responsibility to please one person. And that's Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that so often you're like me. We strive to please everybody else. And in the process of pleasing everyone else, we're not pleasing Jesus. Paul says, be a soldier. Be a dedicated soldier. He gives a third metaphor. The third metaphor is to be like an obedient athlete. The the word that Paul uses here has the idea of persistence. It's it's a great determination to win. Now, when Paul wrote this, there was actually what was called the Greek Games that were going on. The Greek Games were the precursor to the Olympic Games. And to participate in the Greek Games, there were actually three steps, three requirements to participate in the Greek Games. You, first of all, had to be Greek. So, So you couldn't be of any other nationality and to participate in the Greek games. You had to prove your nationality that you were Greek. Secondly, you had to train for at least 10 months. And not only did you have to train for 10 months, but you you had to present yourself before the god Zeus or the statue or whatever of the god Zeus and make a vow that you had trained at least 10 months. And then you had to participate by the rules. Whatever contest you were in, you had to do that contest According to the rules, if you violated any one of those three, you were disqualified. And Paul is using that analogy for us as believers, saying that we must be what? We must be obedient athletes. Likewise, a follower of Jesus Christ, we might say, must be born again. You must have the right nationality. You must be dedicated to Christ. And you must play by the rules. Not your rules, but his rules that he lays down in his word. Paul talked about how this affected him personally in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul, Because Paul made this statement, he said, I'll put the verses on the screen. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Paul then gets personal. So I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as somebody who's air boxing or boxing the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under subjection, lest that after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says you want to pass on what you believe, be an obedient athlete. And he says, fourthly, the fourth metaphor is he says, be like a hardworking farmer. In verse 6, be like a hard-working farmer. That metaphor is a little difficult for us to understand because there aren't many farmers in South Florida. Do we have any farmers here with us today? Probably not, right? Not many farmers in uh, South Florida, and so it's difficult for us to understand the metaphor that Paul is using. My father-in-law is a farmer. We could say that dad's a farmer, right, Vic? My father-in-law is a farmer. He's one of the hardest-working men I have ever met in my entire life. As a matter of fact, at 84 years old, he still works circles around me. Vicky will call at 8 or 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. Where's dad? He's out working. (laughs) I'm like, doesn't this guy ever stop? I mean, this guy works all the time. The farmer's life is one of routine. Much of the work is unglamorous. Much of the work is uh, unattractive. Yet it's faithfulness to the task which allows the farmer to reap the rewards of his labors. 
That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, for us to reap the rewards of our labors, we must have the faithful dedication, the Christian ethic, the Christian hard work ethic of the farmer. Church, here's what I want you to catch today. God wants you to realize that you are an important link in the chain of Hollywood Community Church. You might sit back and say, no, Brian, I'm not. I'm I'm insignificant. I'm not a leader. You are. You're an important link in the chain of the history of Hollywood Community Church. God in his sovereignty brought you here. God in his grace saved you. God in his power equipped you through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God. He has given you everything you need to be a chain in the link of our ministry. Don't minimize who you are. Don't minimize what God has called you to do. We need you. Hollywood Community Church needs you. Our church, our community needs you. Here's the second thing that I want you to see, and i got to go quickly, but it's this. As a connecting link, you connect this generation of believers with the next generation of believers. As a connecting link, you connect this generation of believers with the next generation of believers. Each link in the chain, and I don't have the chain here, but each link in the chain must realize the importance not only of the link that is behind it, but must realize the importance of the link that is in in front of it. Every link, every connecting link is extremely important. Here's what I want you to see. Your spiritual connection to the next generation is extremely important. I think as I, as I was thinking and praying through that, I could not help but think of Joshua's generation there in the book of Judges. If you're familiar with the story of Joshua and then with the story of Judges, you'll realize that Joshua's generation was probably the most successful generation in the Old Testament. God used them greatly. You know the story. It was the bravest. It was the most successful generation. They saw and experienced the miraculous hand of God. As we get to Judges chapter 1, only 71 years had passed since they had escaped from the Egyptians. Same generation. They'd seen, this generation had seen the destruction of the Egyptians with their own eyes. They'd experienced the miracles of the desert. They'd crossed the Jordan River. They had seen and experienced God parting the waters and crossing the Jordan River on dry ground. They conquer. They would have been children that would have sat back and watched the walls of Jericho miraculously fall down and watched the people of God miraculously conquer the land that God had promised to them. What a miraculous, what a, what a successful history to pass on to their children and pass on to their grandchildren. Surely they would tell their kids, surely they would tell their grandkids that it was God who rescued them, that they needed to believe in in the God of Israel. God rescued them, fed them, guided them, and fought for them. But that's not what happened. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, in my mind, may be one of the saddest verses in the Bible. It says, and there arose, or excuse me, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord for the work that he had done in Israel. I sit back and think, how is that possible? They'd experienced, they'd seen with their very eyes, they'd experienced themselves the miraculous work of God. How could they not pass that on to their kids? Again, it says there arose a generation after them that did not know the Lord. How tragic. I submit to you today that there's nothing more tragic than one generation of believers not passing their faith on to the next generation. Can I say that again? There's nothing more tragic than one generation of believers not passing their faith on to the next generation of believers. You sit back and say, okay, Brian, What should we do? How should we do that? Let me give you three things in your outline, and I'm going to give them quickly to you. The first is this. You and I must pass on the truth of the gospel. 
We must pass on the truth of the gospel. You say, Brian, what does that look like in, in this day and age, in 2020, with our hectic schedules, with, with everything going on? What does that look like? It looks like this. It's as simple and yet as complicated as parents passing on the truth of the gospel to their children. It's that simple. You say, Brian, how does that happen? It's the consistent sharing of the gospel message, telling our children over and over again, there's a God in heaven who loves you. There's a God in heaven who loves you so much that he sent Jesus, his son, who came to earth and lived the perfect life and died for you in your place. He died, but three days later he rose again, and now he lives forevermore to make intercession for you, to share that over and over and over and over again with our kids the consistent sharing of the gospel, but then there's the living out of the gospel. Because you, you can only say it, you got to live it. Because if you say it and you don't live it, what do the kids see? <coughs> Hypocrisy. I speak with many kids over and over again who tell me, hey, Brian, you know what? Man, mom and dad acted one way at church, but they acted another way at home. They, they said one thing while they were at church, but they said a different thing while they were at home. They didn't live out the truth of the gospel. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, you got to do that. Yesterday we were, we were in the service and, and I was sharing this and, and, and one lady, bless her heart, she was in the second row. She yelled out, but what happens, Brian, if we did that and our kids still don't believe? I said, man, what a great question. I said, then here's what you do, then you hit your knees and you cry out to God. You cry out to the Holy Spirit of God, the great evangelist, that he would grab a hold of the heart of your child, that he would grab a hold of the heart of your grandchild. Parents, we must evangelize our kids. We must pass the truth of the gospel from one generation to the next. There's a second aspect of that, though. And let me mention one verse, though, because John talks about this in 3 John chapter 4. He says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. And those of you who had experienced that know that there's no greater joy. The other part is, is Hollywood Community Church discipling and teaching God's word to our children. Hands down, one of the most important ministries in our church is our children's ministry. You might not know that it's going on, but right now we have scores of folks that are in the back that are teaching your boys and girls, teaching your grandkids, teaching kids God's word. And they're doing a fantastic job, a fantastic job. But I'd say this, we desperately need help. Chase is stretched to the max. We desperately need help. We need helpers on Sunday morning. We need teachers on Sunday morning. We need helpers on Wednesday night. We need teachers on Wednesday night. Would you be willing to set up and stand up and say, the next generation is so important to me that I want to be involved in teaching God's word. You said, Brian, I've never taught anybody. First of all, you don't have to be a teacher. You can be a helper. You can learn as you go. But we've got to see the importance of doing that. Here's the second thing I want you to see, and I want to, I want to step on some toes a little bit if I can. You must pass on the love for the church. You must not only pass on the truth of the gospel, you must pass on the love for the church. Here's the simple reality, folks. Here's the simple reality. Your kids love what you love. You're a UM fan, what are your kids probably going to be? UM fans. You're an FSU fan, what are your kids probably going to be? FSU fans. <laughs> Did somebody say unsaved? Is that what they said, huh? Uh, if you're a Dolphins fan, sadly, what are your kids probably going to be? <laughs> Dolphins fans. What's my, what's my point? For the most part, your kids love what you love. And your kids dislike what you dislike. The same thing is true for the church. If you love the church, more than likely, more than likely, not all the time, it's not a... 100% thing, but more than likely, they're going to love the church. If you're unfaithful to church, they're going to be less faithful than you are. If you criticize the church, they're going to question their faith. I don't know how many times uh, I've talked with millennials who are questioning their faith, and it all began because mom and dad were taking them to a church, and yet they were critical of the very church that they were attending. And the kids were like, <laughs> they can see right through it. 
They can absolutely see right through it. Be faithful. If you're uncommitted, they will leave. If you're uncommitted, they will leave. One of the greatest blessings you can give to your children is to give them a deep love for the church. Why is that? It's the bride of Christ. <laughs> it's, a, it's an organism that God loved, that Jesus loved so much, that he gave his very life for it. One of the greatest things you can do is pass on a love for the church to your kids. The third thing, you must pass on a burden for our community. I love the fact that Hollywood Community Church is called Hollywood Community Church. We want our community to know that they're loved by HCC. There is much to do, so much to do, to make a difference in the city of Hollywood. That begins, that impact begins with the love for our community. Is our community perfect? Absolutely not. You might sit back and say, Brian, man, they're selling drugs on the street corner. They are. There's prostitution that's taking place on the street corner. Yeah, I've passed it. You've seen it too. People just don't take care of their properties like they used to. Yeah, I get that. There's broken homes. Man, it's just not what it ought to be. I get that. But this is where God's placed us. And God's placed us in the midst of this community. And we've got to love this community. We have to have a deep love for them. And we've got to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ to them. Because God has placed us here. Let's pass on that to the next generation. So, where do we go from here? It's 1118. I know my time's done. We've got to take the Lord's Supper yet. But let me mention a couple of things. Where do we go from here? I want to give you four vision things. This isn't rocket scientist science. I'm not going to give you anything really new. But let me tell you where we're going. So part of my job as a pastor is to be a visionary here. And not only be thankful from where we've come, but sit back and say, okay, where are we going? So 66 years from now, where are we going? What do we want to be doing in the future? Let me give you four things. The first is this. It's very simple. Disciples, disciples, disciples. Did you get the point? <laughs> disciples, disciples, disciples. Our number one task as a church is to make disciples. We're not commanded to fill this auditorium, even though if you knew the hours that I spend praying in this auditorium that God would fill every single one of these seats, yet I haven't been commanded to fill every one of these seats. We haven't been commanded to have a great worship band, and I'm so grateful for Jonas and our worship team, but there's nowhere in Scripture where we've been commanded to do that. We haven't been commanded to have a Christian school. We haven't been commanded to do a lot of the things that we do. We haven't been commanded to do anything, but we have been commanded to make disciples. And if we're not careful, we maximize what is less important, and we minimize what God told us to do. In Matthew 28, 19, he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we've been called to do. And we are recommitting ourselves, we are retightening our belts to make disciples here at Hollywood Community Church. We've got to do a better job of evangelism. I confess to you today as a pastor, I probably should be the lead evangelist, and I'm not. It's not my gift, and I struggle with it. But before God, I'm making a commitment to be a better evangelist. We have to be. We're committed to teaching God's word. In the 10 years that I've been here, we've taught from 14 books of the Bible. Can you imagine 14 books of the Bible? Isn't that great? But there's 66 books. We have a long ways to go. So, so, so we're actually sitting back and working on a teaching plan now where we teach the whole counsel of God so that we can make strong disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been called to do. Listen, I'll tell you right now, my job description, very simply, is to find where you are in your walk and help you grow, help you become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to do that? Here's our second goal, and I'll jump over it real quick, but it's simply this. We want to be debt-free. <laughs> this isn't a critique on anybody. It's just a reality. For more than 40 years, we've been shackled by debt here at Hollywood Community Church. We're still paying more than $100,000 a year on the mortgage of this property. Could you imagine what we could do with that money? Could you imagine the difference we could make in our city with that money? My goal, and our elders know, and I'm probably a little fanatical about it, but before God moves me off the scene, I want to burn our mortgage, and I want to pay the mortgage on this place, and I want to be debt-free. Why do we want to do that? So that we can put more into ministry 
and accomplish more of what God has called us to do. The third thing is this. I use the word community impact. As we look out across our community, hearts are broken. I identify with the words of Jesus Christ. When he says when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion. As you drive down the roads of Hollywood, ask God to help you see Hollywood with his eyes. To see the people of our community with his eyes. I guarantee you he's not frustrated by the traffic. I guarantee you he's not disgusted by the people that are along the road. I, he, he's not turned off by everything. His heart is broken as he knees, sees the spiritual, the physical needs in our community. May God break our hearts for our community. And may we have an impact on our community. There's so many broken homes, displaced families, drug addiction, poverty, unemployment. Wouldn't it be great if we as a church could begin to address those needs and truly make a difference in the city of Hollywood? Our elders know I have a dream. I have a dream of building a community outreach center on the west part of our property. A community outreach center that is open 24-7 for the purpose of meeting the needs of our community. You say, Brian, how are we going to do it? I don't know, but if God wants to do it, he's going to help us to do it. We've got to have a burden to reach our community. Let's not, this isn't a country club. We don't come in and shut the doors and thank God we're not like the people out there. We are the people out there. And we need to reach them for Jesus Christ. May God help us to do that. And lastly, we must have a dependence upon prayer. We've, we've come under the conviction that we don't pray as often as we should, as much as we should. You see, the opposite of prayer is self-dependence. We would never say that, but it is. The opposite of prayer is self-dependence. Our lack of prayer indicates our independence from God. Our belief that we can do it on our own. That we don't need Him. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Listen to me, church. We desperately need God. We desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit. Prayer, passionate, submissive, submissive, Holy Spirit-empowered prayer, on the other hand, recognizes that we can do nothing without His power. What if we prayed? What if we really prayed? What if we got a hold of the throne of God and we prayed and we asked God to do what only He could do? R.A. Torrey made this statement. I think we have it up on the screen. He said, when the devil sees a man or a woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray, who really does pray, and above all, when he sees a whole church on its face before God in prayer, he trembles. He trembles as much as he ever did because he knows that his day in that, in that church and in that community is at an end. Church, let's pray. Pastors from all over South Florida, we're beginning to feel the need to cry out to God. Here's what I dream of. <laughs> Crazy dream. I dream that our service starts at 10 o'clock, but I dream that we as God's people show up at 9.30, 9.45 for the purpose of sitting in our seats, reaching out to God, crying out to God, realizing that we can accomplish absolutely nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We must develop a dependence on prayer because if not, we're going to be the same way we are right now in 50 years. We need him. And we need him, we need him to do what only he can do. Would you pray with us? Church, here's my point today. Here's my point. Don't break the chain. Don't break the chain. We've been entrusted with something so valuable the gospel and a legacy of our church. Don't break the chain. Let's make sure that Hollywood Community Church honors God, makes disciples, and serves our city for generations to come. Would you stand with me today, Jonas, and the, or, or Vicki, I don't know who's coming to lead. So here's what I'm going to ask. I don't do this a lot. You guys know I don't do this a lot. I'm not, I probably need to do it more, but I don't. Are you with us? Are you with us? Would you come and bow before God today and make a commitment today to be the link in the chain that God wants you to be? Just come and spend a few moments in prayer and say, okay, God, I'm in. God, I'm in. I want to make a difference, but I realize that I can't do it without you. 
Would you come and just bow before God and say, okay, God, God, I commit myself to you. I want to be that connecting link in the chain. I want to make a difference in our city. Would you come and just bow before God? And as a church, let's make that commitment today. And let's see what God can do in our midst. And may our future be just as glorious as our past. Let's pray together.